We're very pleased today to have three experts um, in the field of chemical um, or multiple chemical sensitivities um, talk with us today. Um, I'm going to first introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Naj, who is an um, environmental medicine and emergency room physician, um, but is also a survivor um, of multiple chemical sen sensitivity. And we've arranged, or she has arranged, for two other experts, Magda Havis and Bill Meggs, to talk to us as well. And so with no former, further ado, I'll turn it over to Lisa um, to get us started. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I really appreciate, Linda, having me here. Uh, and this opportunity is hopefully not going to be wasted on the country, and everybody will watch it by video, and we will be make it available uh, for public viewing you know, at a later date. Um, I'd like to introduce the two other speakers, and I will speak last. Um, Dr. Bill Meggs is a physician and scientist and writer with a long interest in environmental medicine. And he's currently a professor and chief of toxicology at the Brody School of Medicine in Greenbelt, North Carolina. And he is going to speak on uh, potentially environmental uh, triggers to obesity. Bill. Thank you, Dr. Birnbaum, for this wonderful opportunity to come to meet you and your staff, and to Dr. Naji, who's a wonderful communicator and advocate for improving the health of the American people. Now, I've practiced emergency medicine sort of full to half time since 1980, and that's given me a ringside seat to see what's really going on. You know, we can see newspaper articles, um, and you can read it, but when you're really there, 10 years ago we had one person presenting to our emergency department a day with suicidality, with an emergency psychiatric crisis. Now we average 14 or 15 a day. And I don't have to tell this audience about the obesity epidemic. Back in 1985, this is the obesity map. You see, as we go along, we have to add new colors. There wasn't even a category for more than 15% obese. And then we have to add even more categories, and we go on and on. And up to 2010, we have a third of the population obese. I see these people. I worked in the pediatric emergency department yesterday. I saw children who weigh more than me. And I see 30-year-olds who are already disabled a third of the population, who's going to take care of these people? This is the, maybe the greatest public health collapse in the history of humanity. But it's not the only disease epidemic. We have these other epidemics, and they're all related. They're related both through epidemiology. If you got obesity, you're more likely to have asthma or depression and back and forth across uh, we actually discussed this in a book called The Inflammation Connection, published by McGraw-Hill. Actually, the marketing people changed the name to The Inflammation Cure. That didn't keep the New York Times and other press for giving it a very favorable review. Uh, they wanted to cut out my 300 references, and I negotiated there in small type. And we followed it up with a book, The Inflammation Cure Cookbook, And in lieu of a handout, I brought a few desk copies. <laughs> it has a chapter, and we, I think we have enough for everybody. It has a chapter on food intolerances. It's more than a cookbook. It has a chapter on chemical irritants and their role. Now, I can't help but mentioned myths promoted by commercial interests. Things like cigarette smoking doesn't cause cancer. Leaded gas isn't hurting our children's brains. Pumping 53 million tons a year of carbon dioxide is not what's causing the polar ice caps to melt and so forth. And why I mentioned this, the same techniques have been used to thwart environmental medicine. 
uh, to promote the notion that the patients are crazy and the doctors are quacks. Physicians practice in environmental medicine have lost their licenses. They've been thrown out of practice. And also, I mean, if chemical sensitivity is psychological. Nobody's harmed by breathing the mixture of organic solvents and synthetic fragrances and air fresheners and vehicle exhaust. And we could go on and on the chemical environment to which we're exposed to. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the CDC's environmental uh, human environmental assessment studies where they're measuring heavy metals, solvents, insecticides, a host of chemicals in the blood and urine of everyday Americans just walking the streets. Now some of these have been validated, but others we still have a way to go. So what's the difference between conventional medicine and environmental medicine? The conventional notion, a person is sick, they need a chemical added to their body. For every ill, there is a pill. Now, the environmental approach is six people. For certain six people, they need chemicals taken from their bodies, chemicals in food, air, water. And the major intervention, just like lead poisoning and other things, you know, we have chelation and all these things we do for lead poisoned people. The major intervention is to remove the person from the source. Now, which is right? Well, I practice both. Um, conventional medicine has saved many lives, and we have many interventions. I, you know, I treat strep throats with antibiotics or whatever. It prevents uh, complications. And environmental medicine is, is applicable to a set of indications and has been very successful in chronic conditions. And it's an important point that environmental medicine is not about chemical sensitivity. It's about diseases that are induced and exacerbated by environmental exposures. So where does chemical sensitivity come into this? People are chronically exposed to an incitant that's causing an inflammatory condition in their body. They're chronically ill. They have no acute reactivity. They get removed from the inciting exposures. Their chronic illness goes into remission. But they develop a new illness, acute reactivity to the thing that they did not react to but was making them chronically ill. I call this the Cellier Randolph Adaptation Syndrome. It's been overwhelmingly proven in animal models. It's been observed in hundreds of thousands of humans in clinical practice. Now, the environmental control unit is just very simple logic. If you want to study or if you want to find out in a specific patient what is making them sick, just remove them from the environment. Give them clean air, give them clean water, eliminate the chronically eaten foods that they're eating every day, and introduce organic foods on a rotation diet, removing them from the chemicals on the foods and so forth. I was actually awarded a DOD grant to study Gulf War veterans in an environmental control unit. It was approved by the scientific panel all the way up. My institution approved the IRB, and I had to fight for over two years with the DOD IRB about every little point in it, and I met every objection, and in the end, they turned it down. I guess clean air, clean water, organic foods, were just too dangerous for our veterans. There's something else going on. Now, what about the physiological basis of chemical sensitivity? Well, we, this has been solved in the airway, and I was fortunate to uh, do a study where I took people who made, met the case definition for chemical sensitivity, or multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome, did biopsy studies. We did all sorts of pathology, stains, electron microscopy, and whatever. And we saw obvious findings, a remodeling of the airway, which explained why they have 
chemical sensitivity. With proliferation of the sensory nerve fibers with the chemoreceptors and breakdown of barriers between them. I could talk a whole hour on this. I won't. I couldn't continue this work. I got NIH pink sheets that said, um, don't fund this. Everybody knows it's psychological. Now, again, going back to the effort to suppress environmental medicine in this country, we also fed some rats a little bit of chlorpyrifos. This was before obesogens was a known word or, or even been coined. Little doses, no acute toxicity, they got fat. Now, I think a very important point in this is the brain is actually a target organ for allergic and irritant sensitivity. And this is a chapter I wrote in a Springer Verlag book I edited. Um, just like somebody eats shrimp, gets hives, the skin is the target organ. They inoculated their gut. How does that happen? It's neurogenic inflammation, neurogenic switching. The brain is actually a target organ. A panic attack is an asthma attack involving the brain. Well documented in this chapter. So in conclusion, Americans are sick and getting sicker. If current trends are not reversed, I believe our nation will be destroyed. We cannot have a third of our 30-year-olds on disability requiring complex medical care. For every ill, there is not a pill. And an environmental medicine approach can help save us from the current massive epidemics of obesity, type 2 diabetes, depression, suicides, and accelerating aging. And I have 22 seconds. <laughs> so uh, the others of you are welcome to have a copy of my handout. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bill. That was really great. Very succinct presentation, hammering home some of the main points that I'll go into detail um, on in a minute. Now there's an introduction for um, Magda Havas. She's a great lecturer and has done really good research, and um, I thought she would be a, one of the more engaging people to bring in on a subject that's very controversial and uh, very important for people in the country to hear about, which is electrohypersensitivity, or EHS. She is an environmental toxicologist at Trent University in Canada, and she did postdoctoral research at Cornell and served on the International Joint Commission as a member of the Task Force on Emerging Issues between U.S. and Canada. Her previous research dealt with chronic, chem I'm sorry, chemical contaminants in the environment, and for the past 20 years, she's been studying harmful and beneficial effects of non-ionizing electromagnetic frequencies. She works with people who've developed hypersensitivity to electric electricity, and her research involves determining both the ways to objectively diagnose this illness and ways to help people heal. Magda? Thank you very much. It's a real honor for me to be here and to uh, address this audience. I'm going to be talking about electrosmog, which I believe is the missing link when it comes to a lot of chronic illnesses. Uh, including cancers, reproductive problems, but I'm going to limit my talk today just to electrohypersensitivity because it's something that's not well understood in North America. Electrohypersensitivity, I had originally, is an emerging health issue. I think it's actually emerged. It's really quite serious, and I use the acronym EHS, and I realized in this audience EHS means something quite different. Um, so EHS, when I use it, is electrohypersensitivity, and we could certainly use an institute, a National Institute of Electrohypersensitivity. When it comes to non-ionizing electromagnetic fields, it falls into four different categories, low-frequency electromagnetic fields and radio-frequency microwaves. And I went to the NIEH website and found that you do actually have information on both of those. But there's other parts of the spectrum that need to be looked at as well. Intermediate frequencies is a very serious one. So is ground current in certain parts of the United States. Um, and I'm going to be introducing some of these as well. 
Our exposure to wireless technology and electrosmog has increased dramatically. These are the different places in uh, the United States that used Wi-Fi back in 2002, mostly research labs and universities. Within 10 years, this is what the map looks like, and it's getting worse. So our exposure to this radiation is increasing quite dramatically, and it's not only Wi-Fi. When I did my research, I didn't realize that there were actually more cell phones in the United States than the population. Um, and you couldn't have s said that 10 years ago. I also uh, looked at the NIEHS website on electromagnetic fields to find out what was available and came up with absolutely nothing. So this illness, which I think is incredibly important, this pollutant, which I think is incredibly important, is really being ignored by a lot of uh, federal agencies here in the United States and also in my country and Canada. In 2004, I attended a meeting of the World Health Organization. They had a special workshop on electrohypersensitivity, and they said EHS is a real and debilitating pro problem, and it occurs at levels well below our, our guidelines. The guidelines in North America are based on a heating effect, nothing else. They're absolutely out of date. The symptoms of EHS uh, affect all of our organs and tissues. Um, they induce inflammation, as uh, Bill just said. They affect the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the skin, the eyes, digestion, all of those. And I'm just going to pick four examples that I'd like to share with you in this very brief presentation. So I'm going to present four case studies and a form of electromagnetic pollution that affects them. This is all my own research. It's all been published. It's all been peer-reviewed. And I'd be happy to provide references to anyone who might be interested in this. And I'm going to start with multiple sclerosis. A few years ago, I started working with people who have multiple sclerosis to find out if we reduce the electrosmog in their home, whether or not their symptoms would recover, thinking that the nervous system is electromagnetic, our exposure is electromagnetic. And I was getting such amazing results that I thought no one is going to believe the results. Indeed, I actually thought it was a placebo effect, and I thought, my god, this placebo effect is very powerful. So I started videotaping the people I work with. This is a 40-year-old woman who has secondary progressive MS. I went to her home back in 2004, and I asked her to hold her hands out. Um, she is really very debilitated by the MS. And this is trying to hold her hands straight. So she can't feed herself. She can't go to the bathroom by herself. We cleaned up something in her home that I call Agent X. And six weeks later, these were her symptoms. She hadn't changed any of the medication she was on. And we were getting this type of response, in some cases in, within a couple of days, and in some cases within a couple of weeks. Agent X happens to be intermediate frequencies. So we didn't get rid of the radio frequency in her home. We didn't get rid of low magnetic fields. Uh, we actually got rid of intermediate frequencies that are in the kilohertz range, so thousands of cycles per second. And the main culprit in her home was a plasma TV. Plasma TVs are notorious for this. They can be resolved by simply putting in a filter in the TV set that reduces this frequency. But because uh, so few people recognize that it's biologically active, there's no regulations to ensure that this is done. This is another person with MS. Um, and this is an MRI scan showing the lesions in the brain. Uh, this was back in 2001. Seven years, he was living without intermediate frequencies or much lower levels. And you can see that the, the uh, sclerosis has um, disappeared. And this is not a placebo effect. It's not psychological. It's really happening to people. And so this is good news. If you reduce your exposure, you can actually recover. The second example I'd like to give is dealing with diabetes. And we know that diabetes is becoming a pandemic. Um, the number of type 2 diabetics especially is increasing. Now, if you're either a type 1 or a type 2 diabetic and you suffer from electrohypersensitivity, I've classified that as a type E diabetic, which means there's an environmental trigger that will affect your blood sugar. And I'm going to show you just one example. This is a 57-year-old woman who's a type 2 diabetic, doesn't take any medication. This shows you her blood sugar. And the way that she recovers her blood sugar is by exercise. She goes for a 20-minute walk. And in a 20-minute walk, you can see here that her blood sugar before the walk shown in gray and after a 20-minute walk shown in green does exactly what it's supposed to do. It comes down. We're using up the uh, glucose. When she does a walk and is exposed to Agent X, this is what happens to her blood sugar. It actually goes up. And it goes up quite consistently. 
Agent X happens to be a treadmill that produces intermediate frequencies and high um, magnetic fields as well. Third example is looking at live blood. And this is my own blood that I'm going to be showing you. Um, my home, my work environment has low EMFs. I did that deliberately because I know what the long-term consequences of exposure are. And then I expose my body to three different agents, and this is what happened to the live blood. Now at the bottom here, you can see the red blood cells are aggregating, they're sticking together, and when they stick together in a coin-like formation, we call that rouleau. So Agent X happens to be a um, pulsed electromagnetic field mat that is used to improve circulation. And you can see how the nice the blood cells are actually staying apart. It actually increases the electrical potential charge on the cells, so they're repelling each other. Agent Y happens to be a computer that's not um, in, in Wi-Fi mode. So this is just a regular computer plugged in using Ethernet connections and Agent Z as a, as a cordless phone. So when my blood is exposed to this, it goes into Rouleau formation, which is not good. The consequences of this are actually quite obvious, I think, to everyone here, but there are some other more serious consequences. Um, the red blood cell aggregation has been associated with things like diabetes, stroke, uh, heart attacks, Alzheimer's disease, and quite a few other things as well. And the symptoms that people get if their blood sticks together um, are these. And so one of the benefits, I think, of live blood is that we might be able to use it as a diagnostic for people who are electrically hypersensitive. It won't work for everyone, but it will work for a handful of people. The last example I'd like to give you is dealing with heart attacks or anxiety attacks. Many of the people I work with who are electrically hypersensitive tell me that they go into a certain environment and suddenly their heart will start palpitating. And so what we've done is, you know, we can measure the heart. So we've done a study with 25 people from Colorado, and this is showing their heart rate variability results, uh, showing the number of beats of their heart rate, uh, 58, 56, and 58 beats during three three-minute segments. Now, this particular person was exposed to the Agent X during segment two, and you can see there's virtually no difference, no change in the heart rate or the heart rate variability, and this person was non-responsive. Here we have a very different response. This person is in a supine position, so they're lying down. We turn on Agent X, and their heartbeat goes from 68 to 122 beats per minute when they're exposed, and it goes back um, to the normal baseline for them very, very quickly. And obviously, this is a highly responsive person, and what they're experiencing is tachycardia. Now, this was one of the more extreme examples. Usually, the heart rate will only go up 10 or 20 units rather than a, a doubling. And the agent here was a cordless phone base station. So for people in the audience who have one of these cordless phones, one of the things you should realize, it's emitting 24-7, whether you're using the phone or not. And if you have it next to your bed, you're exposed to microwave radiations on a regular basis. Now, one of the concerns we have about 2.4 gigahertz, which is the frequency of that phone, is that kids now that are attending schools where Wi-Fi has been introduced, they're beginning to suffer from uh, headaches, all sorts of problems, including heart problems. And in one of the schools in Ontario, when the parents started talking, we found out that after Wi-Fi was introduced into the school, quite a few of the kids had heart issues um, to the point where they were going to their pediatric cardiologist. And what the school did is they installed defibrillators. And when parents asked them if they would simply turn off the Wi-Fi for a month to see if there was any difference, um, they simply refused to do that. How many people have EHS? Well, I think about 3% of the population has severe symptoms and about 35% has mild to moderate symptoms. In the United States, that um, if those numbers are even close, we're talking about 9 to 100 million people. So we're talking about an incredibly large population. In um, Europe, uh, European Union, it's even worse. Now, I know um, kids' and children's uh, health is a really big issue here. And you know one of the things that I would absolutely love to come out of NIEHS is some warnings so that people can use the technology safely or in, or in a safer manner. For example, putting it in your pocket is not a good idea. Being pregnant and using your Wi-Fi-enabled uh, computer on your lap 
We have baby monitors that basically work 24-7, emitting the infant to microwave radiation. In Europe, you can get um, sound-activated baby monitors. They're illegal in North America. We can't bring them in. The FCC actually uh, prevented them from coming in. We used to have them available. And when people try to import them, the companies there will say, we can't uh, send these to North America. So that needs to be changed. We have Wi-Fi in schools, and we have kids holding um, microwave transmitters next to their head. We can continue to ignore this. Levels are going up, and they're going to continue to go up. And I say that because last year, the federal communication actually made $45 billion selling parts of the spectrum to the wireless industry. And one of the things they've come up with um, are RF emitting uh, thermometers. So you put a soother in a child's mouth, and that will send the cell phone information about what the baby's temperature is. They have the same thing for diapers. The diaper will send the information to the mother's cell phone, telling them um, that the diaper is wet. So if we don't want cell phones, Next to the head, we certainly want a microwave transmitter inside an infant's mouth. We've had issues in the past, and we've resolved some of these already. Uh, E-smog, I think, is going to be the next big issue. And there's issues with both reproduction and cancer that I haven't talked about. Now, we've done some sperm studies as well. This hasn't been published yet, uh, but there are over 20 reports showing that it affects sperm and causes DNA damage. And this is just an example of sperm at the top left after one hour um, and at the bottom that's been exposed to RF radiation and after five hours on the right. And I think if you look at the sperm at the lower right, you can see that those guys aren't doing very well. Now, I wanted to lighten this a little bit, so I'm going to show you a little um, uh, music video, and I hope the sound works, uh, called Nuking Your Johnson. They used to say cell phones gave you cancer, but that was like 15 years ago. You've heard the rumors about brain tumors, but your cell phone company says it ain't so. Once in a while, you get a lecture from your mom. Blah, 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 something said by Dr. Oz. It wasn't nothing about roasting your nuts. Flamboy and your boys, cooking your junk. Oh, you didn't know. How could you know your cell phone's been nuking your Johnson? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Magda. That was really great. I'm glad we included that just for a little levity. Um, and I think the importance of what you were saying is um, really there. Uh, I'm going to do a presentation without as many fun diagrams. and, and um, But I think it's really important to get the audience to be able to understand um, the complexity of the issues through data and studies, but also um, to listen to people who have become ill um, and have recovered so that we, you know, we're representing really the whole country who is sick, who can't be here today. So my talk um, is on environmental medicine and clinical approaches to mold exposure or mycotoxicosis and electrosensitivity and obesity. Uh, some of the principles that I'm going to discuss apply to so many different diseases. It's not just these three, but I'm going to give some supportive data to these subjects. <clears throat> um, also, I'm going to discuss a successfully treated case of severe electrical and chemical sensitivity and discuss treatment methods, because I think that's what the public is ready for. So uh, I don't really have any financial you know, uh, conflicts of interest, but I do have involvement with various groups um, one of them is a nonprofit, the Preventive and Environmental Health Alliance, that for 10 years has assisted thousands of families to find medical assistance and uh, doctors nationwide and facilitated talks. I've been giving talks at universities and government meetings over the past uh, 12 years. I'm vice chair of the Integrative Medicine Consortium, which represents thousands of doctors and other practitioners, and now we're focusing on the Flint water crisis and lead in uh, cities across the country that has become a popular topic of conversation and an urgent thing to really get a handle on. Um, I'm on the Health and Buildings Roundtable at NIH, 
which has um, been around for about three years. We have an annual meeting in December, and we would like to have more involvement of NIEHS as well, looking at electrical, mold, building materials, all sorts of exposures and considerations when we construct and, and, and build homes and workplaces. Um, I'm the medical director of the Environmental Health Center of Martha's Vineyard, and it's modeled after Dr. William Ray's practice at the Environmental Health Center of Dallas. And I invite any of you to go there and see patients with him. It's life-changing. It's the best center in the world. And uh, Dr. Ray is about 81, and he really knows uh, how to fix patients and has the best allergy testing uh, in the world. I was on the CDC's National Conversation on Chemicals and Public Health, where three recommendations that we worked on together um, were proposed and accepted by the leadership group. Uh, looking, one of them looked at mold, toxins, and pregnant women as potential contributors in the autism epidemic. And I presented to Congress on the uh, Subcommittee on Veterans Health, and we won support of Congresswoman Brownlee, who's the vice chairman, woman, and Wes Ashford, who's a leading VA researcher on postural tachycardia, and he's told me that there is $100 million now being dedicated towards solely environmental exposure based on our work together. So my feeling is that healthcare billions would be saved by getting to the cause of disease, which is totally possible, and I'm living proof of that, which we'll go into detail in a minute. I'm honored to be here and to, to discuss the past and the future of environmental medicine, as well as the plight of patients suffering with EI or environmental illness, of which there are millions or tens of millions now. These doctors and patients cannot fly, take buses, stay in carpeted hotel rooms, coexist in lecture halls with scented attendees wearing cologne or shampoo in their hair that's not unscented. We can't go to the bathroom when there are air fresheners in the bathroom. This has made it hard to effectively communicate with agencies such as NIEHS or NIH. And we want to suggest studies that could be done on EI, um, but we may need to communicate remotely because some experts won't be able to come in person the way we are. Even when I lecture, I need to, take detail, uh, to have detailed notes because I may have a little bit of persistent memory impairment from my suffering from the condition. So excuse my uh, looking at the slides. Um, but we can readily fix diseases by looking into the environmental roots of people's conditions. It's not theoretical, it's practical, often a very low-tech approach, which I will uh, describe. Um, I was taught in medical school to believe the patient by Plum and Posner, a very famous neurologist, who said when the patient had this hemibolism, she would walk through the doorway and have symptoms, and everybody thought she was crazy. And... Um, now I do believe patients, no matter how incredible their story is. This is an article that Cornell Medical School wrote about my work called Believe the Patient. And it mentions that after suffering from toxic mold, which made me sick, class of 86, I have devoted my career to validating and treating environmental illness, which I guess is what we're doing here today. So I'm going to discuss mycotoxicosis. And I feel, uh, from my experience and from seeing patients and Dr. Ray's patients, that mold is the most common cause of chemical sensitivity, electrical sensitivity, and chronic and neurologic uh, uh, immune disease. Sometimes Dr. Ray uh, feels that pesticides have been a bigger culprit, but I now think mold is superseding. Taking a history often reveals that the patient became sick after buying a home with a musty basement or going to a school or workplace with wet ceiling tiles, or some other evidence of a leaky roof that needs to be repaired. Usually they're doing that at the last minute after the mold has already been there for a few years. Molds produced measurable mycotoxins in the urine. Aflatoxin, ochratoxin, trichocythines, and gliotoxin will be spelled out later, and we can measure them um, at a particular laboratory, and it's now covered by Medicare and Blue Cross. So there's no excuse not to screen the patient. Molds also produce VOCs, and I'm not sure if this is the right term, but I think it's 1,3-octadiene, has been shown in moldy homes in a Katrina home to be uh, uh, exposed, the fruit flies are exposed to this chemical, and they get Parkinsonism. And we have uh, many examples of people with Parkinson's-like symptoms from living in a moldy home, which resolves when you leave the moldy home. These are... Um, some of the mycotoxins that we've been measuring for the past maybe five or ten years at real-time labs, they would be happy to work with NIEHS in any capacity, I'm sure, 
And I've been checking maybe 100 or 200 patients for the mycotoxins, and the reds are the positives. People are sicker when they have all three, and now there's a fourth toxin called gliotoxin. I would say that aflatoxin is the rarest, and it's usually um, positive in autistic children. Aflatoxin's in peanuts, which probably everybody knows. Ochratoxin is a, a kidney toxin, and trichocythines are the most lethal. They've been studied by the Army because they burn off the skin. They're a couple hundred times more potent than mustard gas, and uh, soldiers, when exposed, have to discard the clothing. It's not washable out of the clothing. This is a ga uh, gas uh, chromatographic uh, assessment of the dust in a home, or uh, maybe it's not gas, um, of the dust in a home showing the number of mycotoxins present um, because many more can be measured by chromatography than can be measured in the urine at this point. So mold harms the adrenal. There's great research in animals showing what we see in humans every day. Rats exposed to aerosolized, breathing in the trichocythines, are lethally injured. They die. Dr. Thurman in the Army in 1988 studied these rats and showed that it was only the female rats that developed adrenal necrosis and died. A second study was when he took testosterone and gave it to the female rats and they lived. He made them into males and they survived. So it demonstrates really what I see every day in my practice, that a couple in a moldy home will not become sick at the same rate. The man will become less physically impaired but have maybe uh, belligerence, uncooperative behavior, uh, memory loss, and sometimes cutaneous rashes. The woman will become chemically sensitive, fatigued, and completely impaired and disabled. So the woman becomes sick first, the husband does not believe her, and they often divorce while well, she's searching to find a cure for the illness. I would like NIEHS to design a study of this in humans who are mold exposed, as this is such a common phenomenon. This is an example of life-threatening pemphigus foliaceus due to mold exposure. It's now in the healing stage. The person completely uh, blistered the entire skin, back, front, everything. And um, with detoxification and getting out of the moldy home, the rash has cleared up and been well, been good for about 10 years. Another trigger to this particular autoimmune disease with positive desmoglein antibodies in the skin was gliadin or gluten. The person went off gluten and there has never been a lesion. The person eats gluten and gets a lesion the next morning. They say that the most common triggers to autoimmune disease are mold, mercury, and gluten. So with autoimmune disease, you take a history and do that for part of the workup work uh, at the beginning. So there was a family of four, and they had rising mycotoxins in the urine after leaving a moldy home and the clothing. So why do the mycotoxins continue to go up in the urine if they left the toxic environment? And why was the father's urine negative? The wife and kids did sauna, and the father did not. He was incredulous. This inspired me to do a pilot study on urine mycotoxins pre and post sauna. So I haven't published, but I did do some research. I sent people for urine testing before sauna and after, and I had them collect the urine one, after, one hour after a 30-minute sauna about 150 degrees, low temperature. Invariably, every single case, the toxins went up on the second specimen, most often the ochratoxins and the trichocythines, and sometimes aflatoxin. The numbers went up five to 10 times after the sauna. So I tested about 30 patients, and I presented this at various meetings. Here's one patient. Pre-sauna, you see the ochratoxin value is zero, and so is aflatoxin, and trichocythine is very low. The afternoon case uh, specimen shows ochratoxin of 2.8, where a 2 is a positive. The aflatoxin was 6.8, where 1 is a positive. And the trichocythines are positive at 0.6 because that's much, uh, the parts per billion is 0.2 for a positive trichocythine. So a 0.6 is highly significant. So the significance of the sauna mycotoxin study is that it shows that it may be useful as a treatment to get the toxins out of the patient, as we see in other toxins that have been measured in both sweat and in urine after doing sauna for solvents and pesticides. Um, also, it gives a higher yield for the test. So if you get a test before sauna, don't give up. 
repeat the test, and the repeat tests are 66% off. So really there's a financial incentive because of this one family and their mystery case, they've made testing available to all to make the diagnosis. So the mental and neurologic symptoms of mold exposure include becoming chemically and electrically sensitive, potentially. You can get adrenal insufficiency, dysautonomia, which we're going to go to, into in detail. You can get a change in the neurotransmitters and therefore behavior and mood. You can get a decline in the nutritional status because you're using your nutrients to detoxify and there's nothing left, especially glutathione. You can have tissue hypoxia, and that's damage to the capillaries leading to hypoxic tissues throughout the body. You can get direct toxic effects on the brain by spec scanning, uh, illustrated by spec scanning. And you can develop antibodies to the nervous system, skin, and other. And there's a great book called Mold and Mycotoxins by Kay Kilburn, um, who is now deceased. And he published a number of articles showing the changes that happen to people in wet buildings uh, in terms of uh, EEG changes, conduction velocity changes. It's fascinating. You can have an inhibition of protein synthesis, and that's been published many times. And you can have some changes in the membranes and cation transport affecting potentially L-type volt voltage-gated channel, calcium channels. And this may be the mechanism of electrohypersensitivity, which has been discussed in the literature and at meetings by Martin Paul. And this is where the cutting-edge research should be on these calcium channels and those chemicals or toxins that damage it. And then when you administer electromagnetic frequencies to somebody, it is doing something to those calcium channels, and then you experience uh, incredible symptoms. Chronic fatigue patients are la largely are mold exposed. An infectious disease physician, Dr. Brewer, showed that 93% of chronic fatigue patients had mycotoxins in the urine. 55 controls were negative for mycotoxins, all three of those toxins that we just talked about. Chronic fatigue, chemical sensitivity, Gulf War syndrome, and fibromyalgia are in the same basket of diseases. So what I'm saying is there's no point really in separating them. They're environmental illness. Shanessa published that there's a 40% depression rate if you live in a moldy home. And as I mentioned, these other things have been published in the K. Kilborn book. Curtis and Lieberman and Ray also published a very good article on adverse health effects of indoor molds, which I would refer you to. So we're not going to go into detail about all the articles there are on the mechanisms of each mycotoxin on the body, but there is a, a world of literature, and veterinary medicine is much more interested in this than uh, physicians you know, that I have uh, talked to. There is an inhibition of mitochondrial protein synthesis, and this would have to do with energy production, and you do feel uh, very fatigued and weak when you get this syndrome. Spinal fluid analysis by Baraniuk at Georgetown showed that there are 10 abnormal proteins in patients with these syndromes, and they're never found in normals. So they linked all the syndromes together, and they made them separate from people without disease. Okay, so there's a pilot study I did on patients on Martha's Vineyard. I sent them for tilt table testing at Beth Israel in Boston or at Mass General, which is a Harvard hospital. About 80% of my patients that I think have POTS, or postural tachycardia, in fact have a positive test. So in the, in the office, you do the heart rate standing and the heart rate laying down, and it should be about 10 apart, and that's normal. 10 beats faster when you stand up. If it's 20 beats faster, it gives you a clue that they may have dysautonomia. And you can ask the symptoms, do you fold your arms, do you cross your legs, do you pretzel your legs when you sit down? And this is to maintain venous constriction and keep the blood up in the head. So one would think these people are stuck with this autonomia forever. In fact, the patients have been largely improving and are able to get off medications because we have treated them for their, their toxic situation. We've removed their exposure and put them in the sauna and carefully gotten their toxic load lower. Their neurologic system improves and the dysautonomia goes away. Environmentally induced POTS is not permanent. Yet researchers are not really interested in environmentally induced dysautonomia. EHS, exposure to electricity, can make dysautonomia worse. And I'll give you a list of what makes it worse. So this is a definition of what chemical sensitivity is. It's a polysymptomatic 
condition caused by adverse reactions to air, food, water, and habitats. It can be modified by adaptation and your individual susceptibility in your genetics. It can be caused by mold exposure and chemicals to, in a large amount that then causes you to be intolerant to small amounts everywhere. It is not a psychiatric condition, but it can have manifestations which cause cognitive and behavioral symptoms. So people get, doctors get confused. Patient comes in, they're anxious, loquacious, annoying, have 45 symptoms, and they say you just need the psychiatrist. What they need is, is help to get well, and having somebody to talk to about their struggle is not a bad idea. But they are not mentally ill. It is, not, it is a physiologic problem. So EI is ubiquitous. We're all in a continuum from 1 to 10 of being affected by our environment. No one's a zero in this room or elsewhere. It's how you deal with your exposures that makes you more or less ill. So it's very common. And in order for you to incorporate this into your research, whether at NIH or NIEHS, you have to believe it. And you personally have to have a stake in it so that it's interesting to do your work and you're fascinated by your findings. Just doing it for work's sake isn't as fun as feeling like you're putting together the pieces of the puzzle that may affect you or your family member. So how common is chemical sensitivity? It's about 4% of the population. 15% of the population have some symptoms of being chemically sensitive, but the 4% are completely disabled. 40% of the population may have mild symptoms, and that's 75 million people. One third become electrically sensitive. So how, as doctors, can we deny that these syndromes exist? It's ridiculous. Doctors are not taught about it in medical school. These are a number of studies that are done at public health departments around the country and other government agencies determining that it's 15% of the population has symptoms, and in the elderly and those exposed in the Gulf War who were deployed, it's double. So as you get older, your environmental exposures add up and you become uh, potentially more symptomatic and potentially older women who are chemically sensitive can be a little wacky and they wear a ton of perfume. They are completely unaware that they are environmentally ill or they wouldn't put all that perfume on. A study of family practice patients in the waiting room of 400 people given the queasy, which is Claudia Miller's quick environmental exposure and sensitivity inventory, show that 20% of patients in the waiting room had symptoms of chemical sensitivity. Doctors don't really have enough time to get into it with patients, even if they were told this. The chemically intolerant group had a higher rate of depression, panic disorder, anxiety disorder, and alcohol abuse than expected. I see environmental medicine as the umbrella over all these other fields of medicine, including energy medicine and autism medicine. It really doesn't matter what you call it, but it's a comprehensive approach that deals with all aspects of why we get sick. Allopathic medicine is still essential to understand some of the physiology, but we've gone beyond that now. And the history of environmental medicine is that Wrinkle discovered the relationship between food allergy and eczema and headaches, and he published that in 1936. That's how far back this goes. In 1948, he published The Rotary Diversified Diet, and then when IgE was discovered, there was a division between traditional allergy and environmental medicine physicians that has not been repaired today. Provocation and neutralization allergy testing was discovered back in the 50s or so and is still used by environmental medicine physicians and ENTs and is very, it's amazingly curative. If you neutralize somebody to something they're sensitive to, whether it's a food, a chemical, histamine, their symptoms can be turned off very quickly. And anecdotally, I was using histamine when I came to travel. We were sneezing from the bedroom. It had, um, at the hotel, it had down feathers. And we removed the down, but the sneezing had persisted or the pollen here is high. So I used the histamine shot. And it's my dose that turns off histamine release or sensitivity to my own endogenous release of histamine. And I stopped sneezing. Dr. Randolph, who's the father of environmental medicine, followed Wrinkle's work and incorporates this into his understanding of adaptation from Hans Selye into the theory about addiction and tolerance to foods, alcohol, and chemicals. I highly recommend this book to all patients. It's called Alter Alternative Approach to Allergies, and it discusses even psychiatric manifestations of food sensitivity. And then Dr. Ray was treated by Dr. Randolph 35 years ago for pesticide exposure, and he, was a he is a cardiovascular surgeon 
who has then treated 35,000 of us, and I'm one of the patients that he treated. Here's the website, ehcd.com. He discusses the total environmental load and, let's see, uh, ideally avoidance of chemicals makes your total load go down. So the theory is if you look at all the things in your life that are contributing, you can get better. This is the steady state and alarm reaction uh, diagram by Hans Selye, which I will not go into because Dr. Meggs discussed it. And this is a description of pollutant overload, where we have on one side endocrine and immune dysfunction, and on the other side autonomic nervous system regulation, dysregulation. The blood vessels below are affected. You get endothelial swelling and damage. So most of these patients should be ruled out for adrenal insufficiency, autonomic nervous system damage, and mitochondrial problems. Uh, this is a young guy. I'm going to play a smidgen of his video. Lisa Naj, this is a patient who has come for treatment for the past week and wanted to give a testimony for our U.S. congressman and other people to hear about. Hi, my name is Jeremy. I uh, just want to let you know um, I came down here with uh, tremendous anxiety, uh, dependence on cigarettes. Um, I was very anxious. Um, I work in the natural gas industry. I own a business in the natural gas industry and um, became very ill over the last 10 years. Um, now, after having five days of treatment here, um, I've, most of my symptoms are completely gone. Um, I feel so much better. The nervousness, the anxiety, the depression, it's gone. It's lifted. Um, I find that um, the treatment here has really helped with uh, my positive outlook on life and it's lifted the veil that I had o over my life is completely gone. Um, so I think that if whoever's out there listening to this, I think this would benefit anybody who's had exposures to any type of chemicals in their life, um, any types of uh, molds, um, anything like that, would they would benefit from this treatment. And um, natural gas, the way we found out that natural gas was a problem is because we skin tested and did an injection of it and I experienced all the symptoms I've been experiencing for the last 10 years uh, came out at once and it was uh, it was very enlightening. I have one thought. Uh, we talked about having environmental exposure lead to problems with the autonomic nervous system and with the adrenal gland and you've been treated for both of these problems with midadrine and also the hormone Cortef and it may be hard to tell which thing is doing what, but do you feel that that treatment has been helpful for stabilizing uh, your heart rate and your blood pressure and making you think more clearly? Uh, definitely, that's helped uh, tremendously. Um, my heart rate is stabilized. So that's an example of a young guy who I was going to Congress that week and he was leaving in the driveway and said, here, let me give you a testimonial. It's not like we planned it. But when you see a person of the same age as a veteran, describing doing this basic treatment for five days, and he may still have impairments for sure back in Canada, but the idea is he was able to get that much improvement just from managing the dysautonomia, the adrenal insufficiency, and doing the IV vitamins and allergy testing. And I'm sure I won't be able to go through you know, all the slides that I'd wish to, but I'm just going to mention that POTS is this syndrome that really is significant from environmental exposure and it's not well regarded in the literature as a cause. And let's see, these are the reddish legs when people have venous pooling. You can see that the skin color is more hyperemic. There are many things that make dysautonomia worse and I would say that Dr. Christiani's work at Harvard on air pollution and heart rate variability signifies that NIEHS needs to do research on indoor air quality and changes in heart rate variability because it definitely makes dysautonomia worse acutely. You walk into a store and you need a wheelchair. You can't stand up from the dysautonomia. So I'm going to uh, sort of click ahead to maybe a couple of slides that are pertinent for what I would like NIEH to do. The summary of my case, we will now be skipping it because I was long-winded, but basically I was exposed to molded mycotoxins in an aquarium shed that was built and attached to my house. 
the family before me was sick and very impaired. I became sick and impaired. Uh, electron microscopy said that I had hypoxic damage to the mitochondria and that I was told by the neurologist I was probably going to die from Lou Gehrig's. I have Addison's disease. I got the dysautonomia. And it's been 15 or so years, and I've recovered, and I can uh, say that I'm minimally chemically sensitive now. But I was wearing so much perfume and using commercial detergent, I could not tell that I was chemically sensitive. Dr. Ray treated me, and uh, I would say that recovery was um, amazing. My IQ had dropped 50 points, and I was unable to ventilate at night. I was gasping, so I knew I was going to end up on a ventilator soon. And I was able to get to an Oasis bedroom in Dallas with hard floors, filtered air, glass bottled water. And that alone was able to uh, turn me around within days, as well as IV vitamin C and oxygen therapy. In terms of other patients that I've seen there, diabetics put in an Oasis bedroom will drop their blood sugars within days. So I've shared a space with somebody, watch their blood sugars go from the 300s to about 100, and they can tolerate carbs without having the blood sugar go up again. Okay, so I'm going to try to skip ahead to the last slide and show you what things I would like to do in terms of research. So these are some of my desired actions at NIEHS. Let's see that I'd like to see happen. <laughs> I'd like to have somebody hire somebody like Bill Meggs, who's here, as a liaison or advisor to NIEHS or NIH in the area of uh, environmental medicine and bring researchers and clinicians here to present their work and interface with your researchers. Tell the AMA, please, they have to revamp their archaic policy statement on chronic fatigue and Gulf War syndrome and that environmental medicine has no utility. It's 20 years old, and these physicians are holding the entire country back because of their personal beliefs. We need to study the effect of toxic air inside buildings on the autonomic nervous system, mold toxins on adrenal function, POTS leading to Addison's disease, drug and alcohol addiction, as well as essential hypertension. I didn't get to present very good information on the opiate crisis. But basically, teenagers are becoming more environmentally ill, whether it's Wi-Fi, mold, their toxic levels have increased. They're slouched, they're, they're tired, they're pulling leg, blood in the legs. They are seeking out vasoconstrictors of caffeine, nicotine, cocaine, and Adderall to treat their POTS, where we would give midodrine. Then the prolonged dysautonomia wipes out their adrenal glands after years. The adrenals get much worse, and I have data to support uh, the difference in cortisol output when you're standing versus lying. Then they crave heroin because it makes them feel normal again when they feel so miserable on death's door. So if we treated them for their potential adrenal insufficiency or dysautonomia and do a little sauna and supplements, this would be much more efficacious than plain old rehab, I believe. We need to study ALF from Dr. Ray and the mechanism of action of boosting the immune system. It's autogenous lymphocyte factor, and it is unbelievably useful in people with, with T-cell dysfunction. It saved my life. And we need to study provocation and neutralization allergy testing, which G. Monroe in England has just shown works potentially through calcium channels, the way EMF is maybe disrupting the body. So if we can prove the allergy testing is efficacious, how it works, Medicare could pay for it, and young physicians would go into the field of environmental medicine. We should work with Martin Paul and other experts in elucidating the mechanism of EMF, of EMF intolerance so that treatments can be determined for this unbearable and now very common condition. So I think I'm going to stop there. I had a lot of description of some of the details. I have many journal articles. But in a brief presentation, I wanted to give you an overview of how environmental medicine approach is practically available now to treat patients, and we need to bring it to the public so that they can do to themselves what they need to do to get well and not necessarily even spend money on treatments, but to do things in their own home, which can make them better. Anyway, thanks very much for having me speak.
Lisa, just stand here a second. So we've run a little bit over. Are there any um, hot questions that someone needs to speak, needs to ask right now? If not, I want to thank our three speakers. I'm sure they are all more than willing to respond to emails and questions. I know I've got a few um, that I'll look forward to asking. Um, but thank you all for coming. Thanks very much. Thank you.